Right, hello everybody. Welcome to my podcast. I'm in the studio today. I'm going to get this going quite regularly. So I'm going to get straight into it, to be honest. I'm going to talk some boxing, break down some fights, kind of give... I can use the Instagram for a good platform. I can get into 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 pretty good detail, to be honest with you, with the format I've got with the Instagram and even with the TikTok. But sometimes when I'm making these videos, man, about like these legendary fighters, a lot of the obscure ones, I'm not able to go into the detail that I want to go into. So I've had quite a lot of people ask me for longer form content. So I'm going to use this as a as a way to be able to like give a, give, give these great fighters the information that. Uh, the, the, the level of detail and the information that they deserve. So I'm going to get straight into it. Today's episode, I'm going to preview the big fight coming up. Undisputed light heavyweight title fight between Dmitry Bivo and Artur Baturbiev. After that, I'm going to go into my seven goats of boxing. Now, goats, greatest of all time. It's a very, very, what would the word be? It, it, it divides a lot of opinion. With boxing, typically, the goat is kind of agreed upon universally. Um, it's one of the very rare sports in which you can kind of put your finger on one and say, yeah, that man is the GOAT. But it's it's something I like touching upon. You obviously do get different opinions. There are, oh, Boxing's been around for over 120 years, so there's a lot of legendary fighters in that time. But in my opinion, if you follow my Instagram, you would have seen my top 50 boxers of all time. In my opinion, there are seven fighters that stand out to me to have a claim for the greatest of all time. There's one which I'm going to get to in the end that I think um, trumps them all. But of all of the legendary fighters, there are seven that stand out to me. So I'm going to give those seven fighters uh, a little bit of a detailed review, digging those uh, in order. If you if you read the list, you would have seen it anyway. So, But just give those um, those fighters the exposure they deserve. And then I'm going to do a QA. and a I put a little Q&A up on my Instagram story. Uh, I've got quite a lot of good messages in there, so I'm just going to fly through that. So yeah, without further ado, let's get going. Bivol versus Baturbiev. Right, so on June the 1st, we have the undisputed light heavyweight title fight between Artur Baturbiev and Dmitry Bivol. Man, like, you you very, very rarely these days get two pound-for-pound pound undefeated superstars square off in their prime for all the marbles. In the last decade or so, it's only happened once. Terence Crawford versus Errol Spence Jr., for me, this is this is as good this is a, as good a fight as you can get in boxing. For me, both of these guys have proven they're elite amateurs as well as elite professionals. I mean, it's it's a mouth watering clash, and it's one that I was getting a little bit worried that we wouldn't see in their prime with Baturbiev. I think he was just turned thirty nine, so I think this is the right time to do it. Got to say, big up to Turkey Alashek as well for putting the money down to getting these two in. Because with with all of these fights, money plays a big part as well. And we've seen that with the heavyweight division. The heavyweights just haven't been fighting each other. And now they're starting to materialise. Um, so, yeah. With this fight, it's, it's such a hard one to call, you know. it's um, for, Basically, for for years, when I, whenever I was asked about it, because these two have, have clearly bossed the light heavyweight division, uh, the division, They've cemented themselves as the two best fighters in that division. So people have always been talking about a fight, but it never really looked like it was going to happen. But if anyone ever asked me who I thought would win that fight, I, I would always veer with Bivol initially for years. I would always say, and my, my, my opinion would be based on the fact that, firstly, as solid as Baturbiev is, he gets clipped. And it's, I, I could see Bivol clipping him. I don't think it's necessarily uh, what people think now, but when Bivol was coming up, especially when he fought um, Trent Broadhurst, he was seen as a puncher. It was kind of when Golovkin was at his prime. He threw that right hand. He was clipping people. It's kind of veered off now, but one thing that's always been the same is the speed, the distance getting in and out of range, and the skills. Now, Baturbiev is obviously an amazing puncher, and he's very technically underrated, in my opinion, too, which I'll dig into a little bit later in the analysis. But... I could always see Baturbiev being able to knock out Bivol, but in my eyes, I just, I just thought with Baturbiev being clipped by Callum Johnson, with him struggling against Anthony Yard, he was dropped earlier in a fight as well. I just thought that Bivol would be able to weather the storms, Baturbiev would be able to throw onto him, and just keep him at range. Really, just pick him off, maybe hurt him as well. Now that could definitely happen. And as I said, I thought this for years. This was my trailer thought for years. But there's just something about me recently that's just veered towards Baturbiev. I mean, 
when I go on about Bivol's ability to judge distance, it's easy to forget how good Baturbiev is technically as well because you can just look at that lights out power. He doesn't even have to touch anyone hard to knock him out. He literally just grazes people. It's unbelievable the power this guy has. But his amateur record is unbelievable. This is a man that dropped Alexander Rusik in the amateurs. Like, it's a joke. Yeah, he's I, I, in hundreds and hundreds of fights, lost a handful of times. His ability to pressure his opponents is elite. We're talking, you know, like, oh, like triple G level in his prime. Similar to that, a different style, but it's not just it's not just that methodical punching power and walking you down. He can get in and out of range. He's perfect with just luring you in with a jab. He's a good counter puncher. He picks his shots well. And I just can't see him going 12 rounds with Bevo without being able to get to him. And I think if he gets the Bevo, he's going to knock him out. Um, if maybe Bivol could weather the storm, I just, I just, I just can't see this fight going twelve rounds without him getting to Bivol. If that makes sense. Now he has been clipped, but in my opinion, he's shown that he can overcome that adversity. You saw against uh, Callum Johnson, he was dropped. You saw against Anthony Yard, he weathers the storm, and you can say the same about Bivol as well, who was clipped a few times, especially against Joe Smith Jr., a guy who both have fought. Baturbi have absolutely blitzed him away, um, and he weathered the storm too. But in my eyes, I just those fists, man, and that technical skill. I, I, I use the Canelo fight as a bit of a reference for Bivol. Like, although Canelo clearly lost that fight, Bivol clearly bossed it. There was a huge weight disparity. Not not huge, but he was clearly the bigger man. And in times in that fight, Canelo was still able to get in close and work. He was able to land on the arms. He was able to close the distance. And, you know, Canelo's a, a brilliant fighter, one of the pound-for-pound pound greats. But I think if Canelo can do that, what can Baturbiev do? Because Baturbiev can close that same distance. And I just don't think Bivol will be able to wear those shots as well. But either way, it's going to be a fantastic fight. I really do think that these two could push on to potentially the top pound for pound spot because they've absolutely bossed their division. Like Amateur legends. They've been around. Oh, Baturbiev. Baturbiev has been around for a long time. I remember when he knocked out Tavoris Cloud about 10 years ago. So people are only really realizing now, re realizing him now as a uh, a big star. But he's been around for a long time. He's very, very avoided. So, yeah, yeah, both these guys have a very good track record. Both have knocked out or beaten a lot of top fighters. But in my opinion, I'm just going to slightly favor Baturbiev. I think he'll get him towards the mid to late rounds. But I wouldn't be surprised if B-Wall kept him off and outpointed him. So there we go. For me, if I was going to put my house on it, I would go over Baturbiev stoppage later in the fight. Right, I'm going to move on now. I'm going to get into my seven greatest of all time. So, as I've already touched upon, there are so many great fighters. I make videos on fighters all the time. I study boxing religiously. I just love it. I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with all fighters from all eras. I love the old school fighters. Don't get me wrong, but I have so much respect for the new generation of fighters, the more recent fighters. So, I'm going to try and go with this with an unbiased approach. But out of all of those legendary fighters, if I... If I judge their career as a whole, their longevity, their resume, their level of dominance, kind of relevant to their time as well. Because I think it's very harsh when you're judging the greatest of all time to say someone from the 1920s wouldn't compete against someone from the 2020s just with how the sport has obviously developed, the strength and conditioning, the nutrition, the skill level. And yeah, I do think that's true to a certain degree. But if we were going to do that, our greatest of all time list would be 20 years old. What you also have to bear in mind when you're doing one of these lists is the trials and tribulations they had to overcome that the fighters nowadays don't have to overcome. Using that same argument for the old school against the new school, you could say the same that these guys had to fight every week just to just to survive, whereas these guys are fighting once or twice a year, if that. You know, the 15 rounders, even you're going back in history, these guys were fighting 20 rounders, 45 rounders. Like, you know, you have to weigh all of these things up. It's an impossible question, but in my opinion, there are seven fighters in history that I think could have a claim, a rightful claim to the greatest of all time. And I'm going to cover those fighters and why I think they have that claim. But starting off, I need to give a few honorable mentions to people that do, do have a rightful claim, but just slightly fall short from that greatest of all time category for me. And I'm going to start off with a guy that is just outside of this list, in my opinion. I'm going back to the 1940s to the featherweight division, Willie Pep. Willie Pep was a defensive genius. 240 fights and just 11 losses. It's absolutely absurd. 
They called in the will of the wisp. He just couldn't hit him. Just one of the most beautiful fighters of all time. He beat he beat many Hall of Famers, ruled as featherweight champion for most of the 40s, to be honest with you. He lost to the great Sandy Sadler, who's a big, big, like, like the Tommy Hearns of the era of punches. Different style, but a huge featherweight. Um, went on undefeated streaks of over 60 fights and over 70 fights. I believe his record, now this is a little bit of a guess, was 134 to 1 with one draw at one point at a time and survived the plane crash in the middle of it. Willie Pep was just a beast. Wasn't the hugest puncher. I think that holds him back slightly in the greatest of all time when you're looking at a complete fighter, but poor, one of the, the greatest defensive fighter of all time. And sticking on the defensive fighters, you have to give Floyd Mayover a shout. Personally, it was a question I got in my q and I don't think Floyd Mayover is the greatest of all time. I think he's one of the best of all time. I think he is one of the greatest of all time. I think if you put him in a ring against anyone, I think anyone would struggle against him. And I have him tied with Willie Peppers, the greatest defensive fighter of all time. An absolute genius with an unmatched work ethic for his time. And just an unbelievable resume when you really think about it. 23 world champions defeated the most ever of any modern fighter i always find that one a little bit tricky to compare with the old school fighters because nowadays you do have i believe there's 18 weight divisions and about four champions per division whereas in the old school there was eight divisions and one champion and uh the champion was the champion so he didn't have any other champions to beat at the time but nevertheless it's it's unmatched currently in the modern era just a phenomenal fighter. I mean, he his for me his adaptability. Oh, his adaptability was just off the charts, and he kind of had to adapt his whole career. We went from Pretty Boy Floyd to Money Mayweather. Um, his performances against, I think Gatti was a little bit past his best, but it was unbelievable. But the one that stands out to me is Diego Corrales. That performance is just phew, unbelievable. Um, the Canelo Alvarez fight as well is one of his one of his best clinics. You could argue Canelo was a little bit too young, but here you can argue all sorts of things personally i do feel like he navigated his career slightly too safe to be the greatest of all time but nevertheless like i i would definitely have him as the greatest fighter of our last decade one of the greatest fighters of the 21st century and it's kind of a tie with him and the pound for pound star manny pacquiao for me i think floyd was a better boxer than manny pacquiao but manny just what he'd done was like you can't wrap your head around it in the modern era it's a joke so Manny went from, I believe it was light flyweight or normal flyweight, I can't remember, all the way up to light middleweight. It's just, it's, it's absurd. It's 10 weight divisions he covered. He skipped two in order to win world titles in eight different weight divisions. And I think he had a few holes in his game, uh, you know, susceptible to counter punches at times that stop him from maybe being the GOAT. But I think we'll look back at Manny's career and uh, like just just marvel at it. I already do. I mean, even before he was a, a superstar, he was uh, in, in, I think he had nine fights against uh, Morales, uh, Marquez and Barrera. And they were brutal. It's a Hall of Fame career already. But just the way he dominated through the welterweight, light welterweight and super welterweight divisions is just, oh, it was just unbelievable. Just a, a, an amazing fighter. One of the fastest I've ever seen and just the longevity as well. So, something Floyd had as well. But just the way he was able to beat the likes of Jesse Vargas, Adrian Broner, and just at 40 years of old, he, he, he dropped and beat Keith Furman, who was undefeated. It's just, yeah, it's unbelievable. I'm willing to face Errol Spence as well. But anyway, these aren't my goats, and I'm flying into detail here. Yeah, I'm getting a bit carried away. I think we could also give a shout out to Jack Johnson, a man who had to overcome severe adversity, unbelievable adversity, and in an extremely racist time. Beat, I believe Jack Johnson beat over seven Hall of Famers including someone on this list, um, on this list of my goats. Just an unbelievable character. A, a, a huge icon in the sport. One of the most iconic boxers of all time. And for his time as well, you look back, you might think, oh, he don't look very good. But you look back and he was so revolutionary for the time. I mean, you've got to think this is 110 years ago. So you can judge that style fairly. But he was seen as a defensive master where most boxers would just slug. Johnson would move, he'd get out of range, he'd out-jab out him, out-move him, and he was a giant. For the era, I think he probably has the best physique. Like, when you look at the 1910s and the old-school training methods, he could fit in today's heavyweight landscape physically. An absolute beast. also have to give a shout-out to Ezard Charles and Archie Moore. <sighs> They'd make my top 10. 
I think Ezard Charles is extremely underrated. One of the greatest resumes of all time. You, you look at the, I think he had 25 losses off the top of my head, but in his prime, I think he had five losses with about 75 wins. He, they chucked him right into the deep end. He he boxed, um, I can never remember his name. It's a Greek name, but the middleweight world champion, who was one of the great world champions. And he just was thrown in with so many legendary middleweights from the get-go. Charlie Burley, all the guys in the Black Murderer's Row. He beat Archie Moore four times. And then he dominated the light heavyweight scene, moved up, won the heavyweight title, nearly beat Marciano, he beat Walcott. And in his prime, was just phenomenal. And if we're going to Archie Moore... An absolute legend. 126 knockouts. The most ever of any world champion in history. But that's just a tiny, tiny little tale of Moore's story. One of the one of the most genius level fighters ever. He could fight out of the cross guard, the shoulder roll. Extremely crafty, extremely defensively sound. But an amazing puncher. And for the most part, similarly to Charles, before he really made a name for himself as champion... He was fighting killers time after time after time. And he refused to play by the mob's rules in order to get a title shot. So I had to wait until he was 38 years old to win the light heavyweight title. I think he got about $500 to fight. Oh, was it Joey Maxim? I think it was Joey Maxim off the top of my head. Won the light heavyweight title at 38 and remained champion for 10 years up to the age of 48. It, there were some really great fighters. And there was a guy called Yvonne Durrell, really strong Really, really strong contender. And Moore climbed off the canvas four times to beat the It's one of the greatest comebacks ever. Um, legendary fighter. Moved up to challenge Rocky Marciano as well. One of the all-time greats. And I'm going to give a shout-out to two more. We have to go with the Leonards. Obviously, Sugar Ray Leonard. Like, probably the most complete fighter I've seen in recent years. He could punch. He could fight. Hands fast as lightning. Uh, and just had one of the greatest... Greatest resumes in modern times. Now, I'm literally getting caught bogged down with these fighters here because I could talk about fights for ages. Marvin Hagler as well and Carlos Monzon, two middleweight beasts who literally ruled the division. And in terms of talent, I think you have to go for guys like Tyson as well, who didn't quite live up to his potential, didn't quite beat the great fighters of his era. But in his prime was just such a freak of nature. I would Just so strong, so powerful, so intimidating, just a student of the game, just so complete in his prime as i say his detractors will say he never beat the greats but man such a beast such a joy to watch and the mike that defeated mike spinks who was a pound for pound star undefeated had moved up to beat larry holmes from light heavyweight frightening uh, i'm gonna give a shout out to salvador sanchez as well who died sadly at 23 with five hall of famers on his record and we got to go with Roy Jones as well. Probably a few I've missed. But I want to get into my seven greatest of all time before I run out of time here. So starting off at number seven, I, I think you could put this guy a little bit higher. Roberto, the hands of Stone Duran. Now, a professional record of 103 fights, 103 wins to 16 defeats and 17 knockouts. You will see me looking down at the phone here because I have to double check the records because I can get them wrong. Duran boxed across five different decades. Like it's, it's unbelievable. He started in 69 and finished in the 2000s. It's a joke. I was, I was watching a documentary on Duran the other day because if, if you follow my thing, you'll see he's one of my favorite fighters. Just such a genius level fighter. People that don't really know the game would just think he's a great aggressive fighter, but so sound defensively, so crafty, so many tricks, absolutely ferocious in his prime. And it's his prime years that, in my opinion, go under the radar for an entire decade. And it's one of the, and people will ask me, why do you rate Duran above Hagler and Hearns and Leonard? Because they all beat him, barring the fact that he did beat a prime Leonard. But it's because of his, not only because of what he'd done in the 80s, even around those guys, but also because of his prime. In 1971, at featherweight, a super featherweight, sorry, he defeated the great Panamanian champion, Ernesto Marcel, world champion, legendary fighter. Duran is just getting started and he's, he, he, he TKO'd him in the 10th round. He's just getting started and he's beating legendary fighters. The next year, he defeated the International Boxing Hall of Famer, Scotland's great Ken Buchanan, in a very good fight, in somewhat controversial, in somewhat of a controversial manner. But nevertheless, he showed his skill for seven years six and a half, seven years, Duran absolutely dominated 
the lightweight division in, in, in almost unprecedented form, really. He defeated the likes of Esteban de Jesus. Esteban de Jesus. Like, oh man, like, and Esteban de Jesus is a phenomenal fighter. I can never say his name. It's Guts Ishimatsu, great world champion who would go on to win world titles. Just uh, unbelievable fighter. During those years, he was seemingly impossible to beat. De Jesus did beat him, but Duran come back twice. Just a ferocious, uh, just, I, I mean, I, I, I I can't explain how good Duran was in his prime. Ferocious, intimidating, like the devil in the ring. So he dominated the lightweight scene, made 12 successful defenses of his title, 11 of those by a knockout over a six and a half year period. To put that into context with Marvin Hagler, who's deemed as one of the greatest fighters of all time and just boxed at middleweight, his only run as champion was seven years with 12 defenses and 11 of those by a knockout. So before Duran was even boxing the likes of Hagler, Leonard Hearns, he'd already nearly mimicked Hagler's middleweight reign at lightweight. But even before that, in the late 70s, he moved up to welterweight and boxed the great International Boxing Hall of Famer, welterweight champion, Carlos Palomino, who had only just recently lost the title and put on an absolute clinic of inside fighting. If you love your boxing, you love your inside fighting, watch the round versus Palomino. And then he, he set up the super fight against Sugar Ray Leonard. Now, Going into the super fight against Sugar Ray Leonard, Duran had dominated for the entire decade, had a record of 71-1 and one with 50-something knockouts, and then went in and gave one of the most legendary performances of all time against a prime Sugar Ray Leonard, and out, just outgunned him. Just, yeah, and, and at this stage of his career, he's on top of the world. 72-1, and one, come from complete poverty in Panama, Absolutely ruled the division, pound for pound one, already one of the greatest fighters of all time. And he hasn't even had the fights, barring the Leonard fight, that he's most known for. And this gets to him a little bit. He was never the most disciplined. He never really trained to on a consistent basis. He blew up. And after that fight, he blew up in weight. He went up to about 190 pounds, partying, knocking out horses. Like The guy was just crazy. Uh, and he was seen as a god in Panama. Um, and his man, his management team signed the fight against Leonard really quickly within six months without him knowing. So he has to cut from 190 down to 147. That it, you could just see it in the performance. He's sluggish. Put into the fact, put in the fact that he's against one of the greatest fighters of all time in Sugar Ray Leonard, who's absolutely boxing his ears off. He has the no mass incident. He stops. He quits in the ring. There's no denying that it happened. The world has seen it, and many people still dig him out for it. So he's currently got a record of 72-2, and two, one of the greatest fighters of all time, without a doubt. He could sail off into the sunset. He's had a great career, but no. He goes in against uh, Wilfred Benitez, Kirkland Lang, and he loses again. He's on a terrible run of form. People write him off. Uh, he has a couple of wins as well, but just a terrible run of form. And uh, he makes this comeback, and he's not really seen as a big thing, and fights Pepino Cuevas after a little bit of time. Now, Pepino Cuevas is a Hall of Fame welterweight champion who has the world record for the most jaws broken during his reign as champion. This guy, in my opinion, barring Joe Frazier, has the best left hook in boxing history. And Duran goes out, it, you know, you listen to the commentary, it's on top rank, they've, they've uploaded it on YouTube. And uh, he stops him in four rounds. Brilliant performance. It starts his initial comeback. He then goes in against the light middleweight champion. Davy Moore, undefeated, a little bit green, but with high insight. Had, didn't have that many fights. But going into that fight, Duran had lost the likes of Kirkland Lang. Great fighters like Wilfred Benitez, but he was deemed a shot. He was given no chance. Oh my God, that fight is one of the most, it, it was a massacre. Duran absolutely massacred Davy Moore. It's one of my favorite performances of all time. And he wins the light middleweight title. Well over, a, well, a, around a decade or more just after winning the lightweight title. And then, you know, he's had a nice comeback, nice little run of form. Maybe he takes it easy. Goes up to middleweight and steps in with a prime Marvin Hagler. Takes Hagler the full 15 rounds, something no one else was able to do barring Sugar Ray Leonard. And wins quite a lot of those rounds. And then goes in against Tommy Hearns in his next fight. Similarly goes up in weight, blows back down. And Tommy Hearns was just a nightmare. Just a terrible day for him. The only time he was ever blitzed with one punch in over 120 fights or 120 fights. And he's done. 
over the next couple of years, he doesn't really have that many great fights and any major fights. And then there's this guy called Iron Barkley, this massive middleweight champion, absolutely demolishing Tommy Hearns. And a 38-year-old former super featherweight Roberto Duran goes in against the younger, much bigger, much stronger middleweight champion, Iron Barkley. 38 years old, much smaller, and goes toe-to-toe with him over 12 rounds, drops him, hurts him, wins the middleweight title. For me, that just cements Duran. It's, it's, it's 17 years off the top of my head after he won the lightweight title, four divisions above and it's actually more divisions nowadays if you add all the super and junior featherweight, d- super and junior divisions in between. And then he boxes for another decade, boxes the likes of Vinny Paz, Hector Camacho. His last fight in his in the 2000s was against Hector Camacho. Excellent fighter, one of the greatest resumes ever. As tough as you get, so skillful. Roberto Duran, in my opinion, has a rightful claim for the greatest of all time. But moving on. We're going to go with the Boston Tar Baby, Canada's great Sam Langford. Now, this is an old school fight in 1910s and 1920s, but Sam Langford, I'll just get his resume up now, his record. He had a record of 210 wins, 43 defeats, and 53 draws with 126 knockouts. There you go. And that is his unofficial record because he was so widely avoided in his prime that he had to go and travel around Europe to fight because people just wouldn't fight him. Now, you might look at that and be like, 43 defeats, 53 draws. That's like 100 fights he didn't win. How can he be the GOAT? But you really need to dig into his his resume to understand how great Sam Langford was. Now, not only was he one of the most fearsome punchers of all time, but he beat the greatest fighters ever. About three or four of the people he beat are in the top 100 of all time. At 17 years old, he goes in against the great lightweight champion, Joe Gans. Now, Joe Gans was a man who has revolutionized boxing. He was deemed as unbeatable. He'd ruled as lightweight champion. Over a century later, is still regarded as maybe the third greatest lightweight in history. And Sam Langford beats him. But because he missed weight, he couldn't win the lightweight title. At 17, he's gone in to beat the greatest lightweight of all time. At the time. But that's not enough. He goes up to face Barbados Joe Walcott. One of the greatest welterweights of all time. At that time, the greatest welterweight of all time. And beats him, but gets a draw. So in his teen years, or early, I think he was 20 when he boxed Joe Walcott, he's beaten the two greatest in the lightweight and welterweight divisions. It's, it's unbelievable. But then he goes up and he fights the likes of the legendary middleweight champion Scan, Stanley Ketchell. Absolutely slaughters him. Goes up to face the heavyweight champion, Jack Johnson, and loses, but... Goes the distance. And Jack Johnson, when he was champion, refused to fight Langford ever again. Now, when the heavyweight champion of the world refuses to fight a former lightweight, that's when you know this guy is serious. Langford defeated, I'm just reading it off my phone here, 11 Hall of Famers in his career. He scored 25 victories against Hall of Famers in 60 fights against Hall of Famers. To put that into modern context, Mayweather had nine fights against Hall of Famers. Pacquiao, 11 fights against Hall of Famers. It's a joke. He went in against the legendary Tiger Flowers, middleweight champion, Hall of Famer, one of the greatest of all time, beat him. He boxed the likes of Harry Wills, legendary heavyweight Hall of Famer. I think he boxed him 20 times. He knocked out the light heavyweight champion, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, a a list of the great black heavyweight champions. And the reason I say it like that is because at the time there was a color line. Um, Black fighters predominantly weren't allowed to fight for the title. Barring any different circumstances, they were not allowed to fight for the title. These are some of the greatest heavyweights of the era. He fought the guy like guys like Sam McVeigh, Joe Jeanette, beat both of them seven times. Harry Wills boxed him 20 times. Sam Langford is a joke. Incredible puncher, incredibly long arms, just a, an amazing fighter. 60 fights against Hall of Famers, beat the greatest lightweight of his time, the greatest welterweight of his time, the greatest middleweight of his time one of the great light heavyweights of his time and boxed one of the great heavyweights of his time. And even Jack Dempsey openly avoided Sam Langford. Unbelievable. He actually went blind towards the later part of his career and had to travel around Europe to get fights. They still weren't fighting when he was blind. They found him later in his life completely blind, completely skint, just in some derelict basement. And he was happy and he was smiling. It's a crazy story, one of the craziest fighters of all time. And given all of that that he'd done, all of those Hall of Famers that he beat, he'd never won a world title. It's, it's ridiculous. But 
Sam Langford. And if we're going on to fighters of that era, this is the one that lots of people have been interested in. And it's the one that I was interested in the most. The Pittsburgh windmill, Harry Greb. Now, Harry Greb could have a very, very strong claim as the greatest of all time. He is without a doubt the greatest, he, he, he owns the greatest resume ever. I've written some notes on my phone here about Harry Greb when I was reading his book. Now, this man died at 32 years of age. There's no footage of him. He's almost, he's almost mythological. Without a doubt, one of the, the craziest fighters you've ever seen. Now, I was going through his career, right? Over 13 years, he had 299 fights. In 1919, he went 45 and 0 alone. He holds the world. He holds the world record for wins against the most Hall of Famers, defeating 16 different Hall of Famers. He's the only man to defeat the great heavyweight Gene Tunney, fighting him five times, and in many people's eyes, deser deserving more than one victory. He beat the great welterweight champion, one of the greatest fighters of all time, Mickey Walker. He beat the likes of Hall of Famers, Jack Blackburn, Maxie Rosenblum, Tommy Loughran four times, Tommy Gibbons twice, Kid Norfolk, Leo Hawke three times, Mike Gibbons, Mike O'Dowd, Billy Misk, Jack Dillon twice, Paul Jeff Smith six times, Tiger Flowers, Mickey Walker, and Basilin Davinsky six times. All of those guys are International Boxing Hall of Famers. Now, International Boxing Hall of Famers are only the best of the era. Even world champions don't make that list. There are a select few especially in the old school. It's just unbelievable. The guy went, in 1919, 45 and 0 alone, defeating many of those great Hall of Famers. In his prime, between 1919 and 1923, he had one loss in 110 fights. It's just a joke. Greb would fight 40 rounders, 20 rounders, 15 rounders, six rounders, 10 rounders. It, he didn't care. When he boxed the great Mickey Walker, he boxed, it was one of the most ruthless fights ever. And you see, Greb, in his younger days, he didn't have that many knockouts. I think he had about 45 knockouts in his 300 fights. But he was an amazing mover. He never stopped throwing punches. And he would just outwork people. So he's supposed to have a pretty weird style, a pretty swarming style. As I say, there's no footage of him. The only footage you can see, he looks pretty terrible. But he's, he's messing around. If you look at the likes of Gene Tunney, Mickey Walker, Tommy Loughran, like the... the the, the footage of the guys he beat, you know he was good because those guys to this day are unbelievable fighters. Some of the greatest ever. In that time where he was fighting, he was hit by a car. I have a list of all of the injuries Greb suffered in his career up to 1919, which is when I had to, I, stopped, I, I haven't finished the book yet. He suffered two broken hands, two broken noses, broken ribs, a broken arm in one fight, ligament damage in his ankle, multiple split lips, a boil on the forehead which became infected and he was hospitalised with fears of pneumonia, cut in the ear which became infected, he was cut over a dozen times, as I've already said, run over by a car, split his head open, <laughs> slipping in the Turkish bath and boils again on his head. He was also in the Navy in the war which stopped him from being as active considering he's had 300 fights in 13 years. And there are many more injuries that I haven't even got to in the book yet. But the one that stands out the most, considering he, def he dominated for so long, is he was completely blind for a lot of his career in one eye, and he never let on. It's just unbelievable. His story is a joke. To deal with these injuries, he would just get in and fight. He would just get on with it. There's a story about him early on injecting cocaine into his hands when he's got a broken hand and getting in and fighting. These guys are just cut from a different cloth. <clears throat> Basically defeated all of the great fighters from welterweight to heavyweight. Called out Jack Dempsey, the heavyweight champion in the world, and Jack Dempsey just wouldn't fight him. So he goes and spars Jack Dempsey and absolutely massacres Jack Dempsey in sparring. And there's people watching these. There's lots of journalists that recorded here. Just an unbelievable, unbelievable story. Uh, and a guy that went through so much as well lost his brother early on lost his wife early on just yeah an unbelievable crazy fight I was supposed to be a bit of a womanizer had fights with the mob was shot at with guns as well if you can read about Harry Greb's story I would definitely recommend it so he's had his last fight I believe against Tiger Flowers off the top of my head lost lost for the, lost the middleweight title 
and uh, he has a he has well he has an eye surgery to take his eye out and put a glass eye in but he broke his nose in a car accident he used to drive like a nutcase as well he used to drive crazy everything this guy did was nuts and he has a minor no a minor nose surgery and uh, at the age of 32 he never comes out of it he dies 32 years old one of the greatest sportsmen one of the greatest boxers of all time dies from a minor nose surgery to deal with all of those broken noses. And his great rival, Tiger Flowers, another legendary middleweight champion, would die the following year at the age of 32 from a minor nose surgery too. But Harry Greb, oh, I can't speak enough about Harry Greb. A legend amongst legends. Moving on, I'm going to go with the Brown Bomber, Joe Lewis. Still to this day, a shout for the greatest heavyweight of all time. 66 and 3 with 52 knockouts. Defeated seven Hall of Famers in his legendary 12-year reign as champion. It's the longest reign in boxing history. Made 25 consecutive title defences. Now, when you're talking about Joe Lewis, similarly to Jack Johnson, you're talking about a man who had to overcome severe racism. He was the first African-American um, athlete or world champion that was accepted <clears throat> by the nation. Um, and just probably the most technically perfect fighter I've ever seen. He threw punches... Cleaner than anyone I've ever seen, with more power, the way he was able to talk his body through, just unbelievable fighter. He um, was involved in some of the greatest fights of all time, potentially the biggest fight ever against Max Schmeling. And in his prime, I believe he was 56 and 1. Now, all of this stuff, I say I believe because I'm going off the top of my head. But when he initially retired, before he had to come back due to financial reasons, he'd lost one fight to Max Schmeling. And he avenged that rematch. On the eve of World War II, now Max Schmeling was a German who uh, actually opposed the regime at the time. I won't say it because YouTube doesn't like you saying all of that stuff. But And this was on the eve of World War II, 1939 or 1938. I can't remember what year the fight was specifically. But the whole world was watching the American versus the German. War was brewing. The propaganda machine was flowing. This is the only guy Joe, Lo Joe Lewis has lost to. And he goes out and blitzes him in a round. It's just a joke. If you talk about class, if you talk about bottle, <clears throat> beautiful technique, Joe Lewis is just a classiest boxer. As I've already said, stepped in later in his career after his peak, fought the likes of Ezra Charles and Rocky Marciano, well past his best. But if you're looking at the guys he beat, you've got Max Bear, Primo Conera, Max Schmelin, Jersey Joe Walcott, Billy Conn, some of the greatest fighters ever. He just dominated in the glamour division. Boxing was huge in the uh, 1940s. But if we're staying on the heavyweights, you got to go with the man they call the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali. Now, Muhammad Ali has a claim inside and outside of the ring. I think in recent years, his claim is meeting some very, very unnecessary criticism inside of the ring because people just see how big he was outside of the ring. But what you need to know about Muhammad Ali is an Olympic gold medalist, firstly. He completely revolutionized heavyweight boxing. No one had ever moved like Muhammad Ali. No one had ever done the things Muhammad Ali had done. Defeating the likes of Henry Cooper, a solid fighter, but Sonny Liston back-to-back, -back. Floyd Patterson. His performance against Cleveland Williams is one of the greatest you'll ever see, potentially the greatest performance ever. And then he gets banned for everything he stood up for outside of the ring, you know opposing the Vietnam War. And he comes back, and then he has his most legendary fights. If we're talking resume, the guy was involved in some of the most brutal fights ever against some of the greatest heavyweights ever. A trilogy against Joe Frazier that is just up there, maybe unsurpassed in, in regards to everything involved. Beats him twice. George Foreman knocks him out in the biggest fight in, ever since. That fight, there's never been a fight that's lived up to that. Maybe the Joe Lewis fight before with Max Schmeling is bigger. Fights the likes of Ernie Shavers, Ron Lyle. It's it, just the most stacked heavyweight division ever. It, 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 the 70s was just filled with killers. Ali gritted it out, toughed it out. Another trilogy against Ken Norton. Showed everything, showed the legendary skill to be the greatest, the chin to be the greatest the heart to be the greatest and defeated the greatest fighters of all time. But as I already said, in his prime at Cleveland Williams' performance, when he revolutionized the heavyweight game, I don't see anyone beating that Muhammad Ali, not even the great Joe Lewis. But I'm running out of time a little bit here, so I'm going to move on to Henry Armstrong. Henry Armstrong was the featherweight, lightweight and welterweight champion of the world. Something you might not 
look at nowadays and be like, oh, that's impressive. But at the time, there weren't any junior featherweight. Junior, I don't know why I keep saying junior featherweight. There weren't any junior weight divisions in between or supers. And he was holding these belts simultaneously. Now, that's over a 20 pounds difference. So he would go up and down and defend these titles. During that time, he defeated, well, he defeated 11 Hall of Famers, which is up there amongst the highest of all time. But during that time when he was simultaneously winning and defending these titles, he defended the welterweight titles 19 times. 19 times, nearly a century later, is still a record. His record is 151 wins to 21 defeats, 9 draws and 101 knockouts. Maybe the greatest inside fighter of all time, barring Duran. Someone that was outweighed by his opposition, but never stopped marching forward. One of the craftiest, most relentless fighters ever. Won all three of those titles simultaneously and went up to the, to fight the um, middleweight world champion, the, the, yeah, the Filipino Seferino Garcia, a man he'd already defeated for the middleweight crown. Now, this is seven weight divisions in the modern era, and he was going to hold them all together. It's four weight divisions in the old era, and there's only eight weight divisions in the sport. So had he have won that fight, he would have been champion at the same time for at half the divisions. And he battered Garcia, and he was robbed. It's one of the worst robberies of all time. Unbelievable fighter. Defeated some great, great legends. Fought the lights of Sugar Ray Robinson, even past his best. But as I say, 11 Hall of Famers defeated. I'll just recap them here. You've got the likes of Barney Ross, Sammy Angott, the man who beat a prime Willie Pep, Lou Ambers, Lou Jenkins, Benny Bass, Chalky Wright, Baby Aris Mendy, Fritzy Zivit, one of the dirtiest fighters of all time. Henry Armstrong, one of the greatest ever. In my opinion, the second greatest. Behind the main man, number one, Walker Smith Jr., Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray Robinson is, without a doubt, the greatest fighter of all time. A record of 174 wins to 19 defeats, 6 draws and 109 knockouts. Now when you're talking about someone that's unbeatable in their prime, Sugar Ray Robinson is the man that stands out for me. He won his first 40 fights before he faced a rough, rugged fighter by the name of Jake LaMotta. A man he would go on to defeat 5 times after. And Jake LaMotta beat him, he outweighed him and he beat him. But that's fine. You don't avoid the fighters that are going to beat you. You get in there, you take the lessons and you learn. He will go undefeated in his next 91 fights. One of the most legendary unbeaten streaks in history. Defeated 10 Hall of Famers, but beat most of them multiple times. In his prime, he was the perfect mix of toughness, speed, unbelievable timing and power, ring IQ, everything. Sugar Ray Robinson had it all. He defeated Henry Armstrong, Jake LaMotta five times, the legendary Cuban Hall of Famer Kid Gavilan twice, these are during his times at well away. And then he would move up and lose to Randolph Turpin. His record was, I believe, off the top of, the top of my head, 129 to 1. Which is just like, can you imagine having a record of 129 wins to 1 defeat now? He comes back and, uh, well, he's already moved up to win the middleweight title by this point. But he comes up to reclaim the middleweight title. And then, you know, he's had his, he's had his best days as a well away. Seemingly invincible. Imagine Roy Jones times two. Do you know what I mean? Just unbelievable. And then he goes into the most brutal and stat middleweight division of all time. You have the rough and rugged guys like Gene Fulmer, Carmen Basilio. And he starts taking a few losses. But he comes back and always defeats these guys. A five-time middleweight champion of the world. The greatest welterweight in history. And he goes up to face Joey Maxim, a light heavyweight. To become the light heavyweight world title. A world champion. Joey Maxim was a big guy and it was extremely hot in that venue. Extremely hot. So hot they had to replace the referee. Even though he was up on the cards late in the fight, I think the 13th or the 14th round, he collapses due to heat exhaustion and Maxim's awarded the victory. We're talking about a man here that beat some of the greatest lightweights of all time. Dominated the world weight scene in over 100 fights come up to the, one of the most brutal middleweight scenes and beat them all and dominated the light heavyweight champion until he passed out due to heat exhaustion in one of the hottest fights ever. Over 200 fights, would sadly go on for too long, but in his prime, just suffered around five defeats. 
and all of those fighters he'd beaten in rematches. The greatest fighter of all time, bar none. He's got about three contenders for the greatest knockout of all time. Most would say his left hook against Gene Fulmer is the perfect punch. My favourite is his one against Rocky Graziano when the mouth guard goes flying. But only ever stopped once due to heat exhaustion. Never knocked out. Sugar Ray Robinson, the greatest of all time. And those are my greatest of all time. Hopefully you enjoyed the segment. Sometimes I can go on a bit of a, like, a, bit of a rant about these people in a good way. I, got, I can just keep talking and keep talking. But those are my seven greatest fighters of all time. And one thing you'll notice is they all had losses. Nowadays in the modern era, it's almost like fighters are afraid to take those risky fights. It's bouncing back from those risky fights that really matter. In my opinion, these guys stand out amongst the others to me. I can't think of, other than the honourable mentions, seven fighters better than these. Right, and just quickly, just to finish off, I'm going to go through a little Q&A. Um, I've gone through a couple of the Instagram um, stories that you sent me. So I'm going to fly through these. And uh, I've got Danny underscore Rob. Is Mayweather top five of all time? That would be Floyd Mayweather Jr. Um, well, you would probably know from going through what I've just gone through. I'd probably say no. I think he's one of the greatest fighters of all time. One of the greatest defensive fighters of all time. One of the great all-rounders. The most adaptable fighter I've ever seen. But I think, as I've just previously mentioned, like, these guys just went in with everyone. I think I would put their resume slightly over Floyd's. Although I do think uh, Floyd could beat any of them on his day. I also think all of those guys that I named on their day would beat Floyd as well. In my opinion, I just think the way his career was slightly navigated in a safer way than those guys it slightly diminishes him just outside but i'd still have him up there one of the best fighters i've ever seen probably the best fighter of my generation without a doubt i i, I do think pacquiao is the greater in regards to like going across the 10 divisions but floyd's 50 and 0 it's, it's unbelievable jack spencer cross what does the lifestyle of a pro boxer as a full-time job look like? So I can speak from experience here because I am a pro boxer and I have had full-time jobs whilst being a pro boxer. So basically, you need to... you need to Pro boxing is hard. You're not going to earn a huge amount of money um, at the start. So you're going to have to sell all your own tickets firstly around everything you do. But typically, I guess you'd be looking at the routine. You get up, you do your road work, and then you go to work. Do your work, go to the gym. It's that simple, really. Um, obviously there are all of the different kinds of things like your own nutrition having to sell all of your own tickets it's why sponsors are so important because training six days a week when we got a fight you got to train 10 times a week doing that around a full-time living you need your rest because it's not just training it's not just going for a run you're pushing your body to its limits every day so it's tough it's tough you have to you have to push through inevitably or until you eventually get to those big fights and the big money fights but that takes years uh, Jake underscore Evans 574 do I think Styles decide or make fights yeah Styles make fights is one of the oldest quotes in boxing and is so true you might have a guy that just like a you might have a guy you just can't work out their style is just so good you might have a better resume better track record but you just can't work them out they got a nightmare style for you I use there's there's so many great rivalries that you can use for this instance you can use like Ali Foreman and Frazier like Ali and uh, Frazier. Frazier was Ali's kryptonite, someone that would just stick on him, gave him hell. But Ali, who beat Foreman and, you know, used this style, used a very clever style to beat Foreman. Um, you know, then you had Foreman that absolutely destroyed Frazier. He gave Ali problems. So there's one there. Hagler, Leonard, Hearns and Duran. Do you know what I mean? You know, you're looking at Le uh, Duran, for instance, who beat a prime Leonard and then goes on and gets blitzed by Hearns, who Leonard beat. So, yeah, Styles definitely do make fights. And last one, Mohammed1879 underscore 11. In this era, can someone be the greatest of all time? What does he need to do to do it? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you go and you just beat everyone and you fight regularly, of course you can. It's hard because you're not fighting the 15-rounders that the old guys used to fight. Um, yeah, that, that and you're not fighting as regularly. How can you judge someone that's had 40 fights against someone that's had 200? Someone that's had a 100-fight win streak? Do you know what I mean? Against someone that's had 40 fights. In my opinion, you would have to fight regularly if you wanted to be the GOAT now. You'd have to beat everyone. You'd have to dodge no one. Chase all the fights in their primes. I think nowadays with the amount of weight divisions, conquer those weight divisions. 
someone like a Terence Crawford, like going up against Canelo, that is something like, I'm not saying that would make him the greatest of all time by any means, but if you had that Sugar Ray Robinson run at welterweight these days, I don't know, say you won 15, 20 fights at welterweight in the span of seven, eight years, and then you went up and you moved up to beat Canelo or something, do you know what I mean? Something like that. Something that's just absolutely unbelievable. But as you've seen from the likes of Sam Langford and Harry Greb, you're not doing anything that's never been done before. You're just doing something that is incredible in the modern era, especially with all of these new um, advancements in the science and nutrition. So yeah, I do think it's possible, but I do always think you've got to give the old guys respect because as I've already touched upon in that segment, some of these guys, it's unbelievable. Right, and that is enough for me today. If you enjoyed the content, please give it a like, please give it a share. Um, and make sure you subscribe. Let me know anything you want to see in the comment section in future ones. I'm going to try and get these out regularly. Thank you very much.